of preventive and regenerative medicine. He was among the first group of physicians to be recognized for his expertise in this rapidly emerging field. The 10th MD in the world to become fully board certified by the American Board of Anti-Aging and Regenerative Medicine. He founded California HealthSpan Institute in Encinitas in 1998 with a commitment to transform our understanding of preventive and regenerative medicine. Try challenging traditional medicine's approach, California HealthSpan's Institute's mission is to create a paradigm shift in the way we view the decline of fitness, cognition, quality of life, treat the cause. California HealthSpan now treats and designs custom programs for patients worldwide and especially in California, every continent except Antarctica. He's always challenged traditional medicine's ability to embrace the uh, new paradigm after graduating from Columbia. He practiced medicine and studied indigenous healing in the Amazon basin for seven years. He then performed his residency in emergency medicine at the Los Angeles County USC Medical Center. At the time, the uh, specialty of aging is a disease that can be reversed. stem cells and lifestyle and telomeres. It's great when it all fits together. And I'm going to talk about telomeres some, even though I've heard that you have had several presentations on this. So we'll go over some, just that, that more uh, briefly. But really, let's see how it all fits together. That's what's really exciting to me. So the concept here, our paradigm, is that we're not prisoners of our genetic destiny. And if, if your genes are programmed, you'd have a heart attack on your 50th birthday, you don't have to go there. You can change the expression of your genes. And you know, if you divide life into different phases, this health span curve, you could say about the first 20 years are about development, and 20 to 40, people are generally healthy. 40 to 60, even might feel good, subclinical illness is the beginning, it's the degeneration stage, and typically 60 to 80, morbidity, these subclinical illnesses become apparent and uh, this decline in quality of life. Conventional medicine is great at emergency situations. I was uh, you know, an, an uh, ER doc for uh, 25 years before uh, the skeptical, very conventional doc realized there was something else out there. And, but again, for emergencies, for broken bones, for trauma, for you know, for, you know, acute heart attacks. Conventional medicine is great, but what conventional medicine does in this health span curve is prolongation of the morbidity phase. It doesn't do anything to stretch the healthy phase. So now instead of uh, dying at uh, 80, something might die at 90, and you get a few years in a nursing home and a few months in the ICU at the end of your life. <laughs> and of course, there's not one person in the world who would want that, but yet it happens every day. So the goal of preventive and regenerative medicine, synonym with anti-aging medicine, is let's expand this healthy thing, this health span extension. Now we gotta die sooner or later, but so let's stay healthy and happy and active and curious and spiritual till the very end and then hurry up and die quick and fall off the curve. Rectangularize. That's what we all want. And what we're hoping is that what we're doing helps us with this goal of rectangularization. One of the themes in preventive and regenerative medicine, the, one of the major themes is inflammation. It's connected with everything. And you can look at chronic inflammation as both the cause and the effect of these diseases of aging. So when you're looking at a nutraceutical or a hormone or a lifestyle maneuver, you could say, what's the inflammation connection? 
and that'll give you some good idea. So again, chronic inflammation is the cause and the effect. And all the anti-inflammation stuff we do helps, helps telomeres, helps stem cells. It produces wellness, peak performance, and since we're measuring stem cell function, anti-inflammation improves your stem cell function. So what we're after here, again, is lifestyle, reducing inflammation, and this is really scientific and evidence-based, and it's documented in peer-reviewed medical journals. Any one of these topics, this really, you know, this, this is an alternative. There's only one medicine. What, what's real and what's based on some kind of evidence. And any of these subjects you put into PubMed, you find thousands of researched articles. So clinically, and I'm a clinician seeing patients, I do that one of my work every day, and so my goal is to design, design a custom program for that individual. You know, a lot of conventional medicine is a cookie cutter. Everyone comes in and goes out with their Z-pack. One dose, dose fits everybody, how convenient. But biology isn't like that, everyone is unique. So you need a customized program, and the way I design this is by getting to know patients well, traditional medical history, physical exam, and advanced lab testing, not just the conventional test. We want to look at inflammation factors, we want to look at key vitamin and antioxidant levels, key hormone levels, and then design a program with exercise, well, what kind of exercise? It's gotta be customized. Stress reduction, nutraceuticals, inflammation control. If someone's philosophy is that they want bioidentical hormone replacement, and they need it, then we can add bioidentical hormones. We can uh, evaluate stem cells, and also bank stem cells as a type of biological insurance. We can bank your adult stem cells that we can get from the blood and put them in the freezer. It's like having your, your twin clone in the freezer. And uh, different possible uses for bank stem cells. God forbid there's some serious illness, uh, multiple myeloma, and need a bone marrow transplant. Oh, you have your own. But better yet, let's say everything goes right. Now this isn't proven by any means yet, but uh, it certainly is, you know, my prediction will you know, come back in five years and see if I'm right, that if we start infusing these bank stem cells that we got at a younger age, on some kind of periodic schedule, it will have some real anti-aging value. But again, time will tell on that. Also, now we, of course, as you know from previous seminars, you can test telomeres and optimize through lifestyle and perhaps even extend them. So again, lifestyle still is the key. And if there's not the lifestyle, you really can't accomplish as much. So that's where help comes from. Exercise, it lowers inflammation, produces more growth hormone, decreases inflammation, moderate exercise. Just like everything, everything in biology is a U-shaped distribution, where there's too much, too little, and just right. Ultra exercise, marathon level, is a tremendous accomplishment, and uh, you know, a, my, mental and physical, but perhaps that is too much exercise, and in fact, it does increase inflammatory mediators. There are strategies to help limit that. But exercise, again, will decrease inflammation, as measured by C-reactive protein, and helps to prevent telomere loss. Stress reduction lowers inflammation. And uh, you know lowered cortisol will protect the hippocampus, that's the memory center of our brain, and there'll be uh, improved cognitive function. And there's a mind-body connection with stress reduction in that when there's lower epinephrine or adrenaline, estrogen metabolites then steer towards the favorable estrogen metabolites, the 2-methoxy series. And so this is a real physical mind-body connection. High adrenaline, the enzyme COMT, catechol-O-methyltransferase, is used to break down the adrenaline. So there's none left over to transform the estradiol to the estradiol that we want. So again, here, you know, there's a lot of, we all know there's a mind-body connection, but I think it can be explained in terms of biochemistry. Uh, here now, here's some references on that I talked about, the 2-methoxyestradiol, and since Everyone's interested in telomeres now. Here's a study of how anxiety lowers leukocyte telomere length. Another mind-body connection that's measurable. But what about hormones? Well, when we use bioidentical hormones, we treat a deficiency disease. So we just don't throw hormones at people. I have to diagnose that this hormone, this, this individual is deficient in this hormone. And then there's the option of replacing it. Goals being quality of life. That's what we're after. Less inflammation. Cut to the chase on hormones. 
two bioidentical hormones in use for replacement therapy increase cancer risk. Do they increase breast cancer, prostate cancer, other cancers? The short take is no. Tremendous amount of data on this, mostly from outside the United States. Same goes for heart disease. But it's a matter of choice. And people have different philosophies, and I'm happy to work with that. If the patient's philosophy is that she would rather not use hormone replacement, fine. We'll, we'll, you know, that might be my preference, but we'll go for another plan. So the idea is to match my treatment with the patient's philosophy and expectations. And hormones are very root dependent. An oral hormone isn't the same as a transdermal, isn't the same as an injectable. They all act differently. And this is a work in progress. If we find that we're doing something wrong, I don't have any you know, emotional stake in doing things one way. I want whatever's best for the patients and, and for myself as, as the patient. So it's a work in progress. We always want to follow what's the current data and uh, use that current data. Now onto hormones, balanced hormones decrease chronic inflammation. And what hormones do we look at in terms of balance? We look at them all. We should add parathyroid to this list, which is not here, my new obsession. But that's a talk for another day. Uh, growth hormones controversial, mostly because of doping in sports. Very prominent headlines uh, today. But we look at them all, from testosterone to the adrenal hormones, melatonin, to all three estrogens, progesterone, the different, uh, the two thyroid hormones, probably there are four, cortisol, and of course vitamin D is a hormone, as you probably know from previous seminars. So this hormone replacement is a clinical specialty. You know, we look at a lot of labs and numbers, but really, it's the, the patient is the ultimate lab test. And it's interesting how this evolved. When our field of, of anti-aging medicine started, we were measuring everything. We used to say, well, gee, look at those other doctors, those, uh, well, we always say, oh, OB Chi won't answer. Hope they aren't getting here. They're, they're, <laughs> we're scientists. We measure and we replace, but really, when the patient and the lab don't agree, I'm gonna vote for the patient. And you know, that's like the, one of the bad jokes in medicine we teach medical students, when all else fails, look at the patient. <laughs> so what, why would our hormones fall off anyway? What's the evolutionary biology of that? Well, some, some claim that, well, let's say, maybe they get lower as we get older to protect us from cancer as we age, in theory. But if you think about evolutionary biology, evolution's pretty blind to what happens after reproductive age. And so they probably fall off because throughout most of human history, humans didn't live very long, 20 or 30, so it really didn't matter what happened after 40, 50, 60, because most humans weren't there. Now, when we're talking about steroid hormones, adrenal hormones, pituitary hormones, we shouldn't forget the basic, the most basic hormones, icosanoid hormones. These are the first hormones in evolution, the leukotrienes, thromboxanes. So, We've inherited them from our one-celled ancestors. So if you're an amoeba floating around in some slime, you don't have eyes or ears, how do you know what's going on in your hood? Well, we make some icosanoid hormones, send them out into the environment, they interact with the environment, tell you where there's nutrition or dangerous chemicals. They come back and react with receptors on this one-celled organism on the surface or in the nucleus, and this one-celled organism has some information. Well, all our 60 trillion cells are still in that mode. And these are the most powerful hormones. So lifestyle measures affect the icosanoid hormones. And Barry Sears started educating the world about this when he first started talking about the zone diet and how insulin controls uh, icosanoid hormones, how glucose controls icosanoid hormones. Now, here's a board game we can play. <laughs> or there'll be a quiz on this at the end of the course. Now, you win the game if you end up in the red box there wellness. You lose if you end up with chronic illness. And you know, connect the dots. Everything's connected. And you take like the middle here, nuclear factor kappa beta. That's the centerpiece of inflammation. That's the cytoplasmic factor that turns on inflammation. So if you're reading an article in PubMed and about say, say a nutraceutical, and if you see nuclear factor kappa beta, how does it affect it? If it controls and limits it, it's anti-inflammatory, <coughs> anti-cancer, anti-atherosclerosis. So nuclear factor kappa beta, when it's turned on, turns on these inflammation enzymes, COX enzymes, LOCK enzymes. They convert arachidonic acid, 
That's the building block of omega sixes. You need some to live, but society's flooded with them, so you don't want any extra. Two, the bad icosanoids. They usually have even numbers. Bromboxane A2 promotes atherosclerosis, and leukotriene B4 causes pain syndrome, and uh, prosperin E2 promotes cancer. You can block this reaction with the EPA in fish oil. Or you could play the game by coming in higher. What turns on this nuclear factor capillator? Stress, infection, glucose, insulin, homocysteine, not exercising, trans fats, homocysteine, prooxidants, viruses. And you can see how different hormones affect it. Estrogen might turn it on, but not if limited by and balanced with progesterone. So we could go on and on. Everything fits in here. If you think of some other little squares I can put on the side and squeeze it in, let me know. And <laughs> Okay. <laughs> now, why are we so inflammatory? Now, I'm a surfer, so I'm thinking in ocean uh, analogies. So, inflammation can save your life. So, if a shark bites you, bring on the inflammation. You need vasoconstriction. That's good. Blood vessels will constrict. If you're getting a letter from the IRS and your blood vessels constrict, that's not good. That could be put on a heart attack. But, it stops bleeding. Fibrinogen. We don't want high fibrinogen, but with this shark bite, we sure do, because that's going to stop, uh, stop bleeding. White blood cells, don't want high white blood cells, but if you have the, the Klebsiella on the shark's teeth, a bad breath, negative bacteria, you want a lot of white blood cells to fight it. And maybe even the pain has some learning value. I don't know about that. So acute inflammation kills us alive, chronic kills us slowly. Why do we have it? One other point, what I call antagonistic evolutionary benefit. It helped our Paleolithic ancestors, but kills us. And there's a lot of interesting examples of that. Insulin resistance. Well, say the Pima Indians in Arizona and Sonora, 80, 90% of the adults have type 2 diabetes. And how did that happen? Well, their ancestors, not that long ago, had a very sparse diet of carbohydrates from cactus plants. And if they could make some, food, make some insulin and store some fat from a little bit of carbs, they would survive and pass on their genes to the next generation. So insulin resistance, the setup for type 2 diabetes was life-saving. Now you bring the fast food diet to the same genetic population, and the result is a disaster. Same thing with inflammation. Our more anti-inflammatory ancestors did well against saber-toothed tiger bites and uh, infectious diarrhea. Thyroid applies to this too. Some people have high reverse T3s. Are you, are you familiar with reverse T3? So thyroid hormones, there's T4, that's like the synthetic sirens like Synthroid or levothyroxine, that's T4. That's a pro-hormone, there's no receptors in the body. That has to turn into T3, three iodines, and that's what, where the action is. But if it goes the wrong way, you get the mirror image, the stereoisomer called reverse T3, that blocks the receptor site. It puts you into hibernation. If there's no food around and the animal is, is near starving, it's good to be in hibernation, you shut off your metabolism, and maybe you live another day when there is a food supply. But this Paleolithic survival factor now caused a lot of people to be hypothyroid, even when they have a normal thyroid lab test. And their doctor says to them, we should write a book with this title, or I ask, I ask the patient, how's your thyroid? And she'll say, my doctor says my thyroid is normal. And I say, well, what do you think? Well, my hands are cold, and my eyebrows are falling out, and you know, and I have no energy. And, and then she starts listing every single symptom of hypothyroidism. This could be the cause. Okay. So again, let's look for the nuclear factor kappa beta connection, <laughs> omega three, one of the biggest limiters of inhibiting NFKB. Less inflammation, less cancer, less atherosclerosis. You see, NFKB. Now, I, I showed you those prostaglandins and leukotrienes. The basic step, even before those, are the inflammatory cytokines. TNF-alpha, IL-1 beta, and IL-6. Those are good to know, because when you see, when you're studying this field, you say, how are the inflammatory cytokines affected? If they're turned on, there's a problem. What about resveratrol? How many take resveratrol? Yes, even my 22-year-old son, yeah. Uh, see, that's fun. What, that's the time to start your anti-aging program. Well, actually, prenatal is really the time. But um, resveratrol inhibits nuclear factor kappa beta, and it, it has other actions, too. It, it 
probably know, it turns on those sirtuin genes. So they're called sirtuin because they're sir one, sir two. These are the genes that calorie restriction turns on. And so our hope with resveratrol is that you get the same benefits, or some of the same benefits as calorie restriction, and you don't have to live for 150 years being hungry. <laughs> so this may explain the French paradox. Vitamin D, I know most of you are very big vitamin D fans, even some of you dare to take vitamin D levels above the dose recommended by the government. <laughs> <laughs> what is the official dose I have now? I think it's 400 or 600 uh, IU per day, whether you're a newborn baby or a 300 pound pregnant woman. Hmm, makes sense. Um, you know, the dose is what gets you, uh, to me, the dose is what gets you at the, at the sweet spot in the, in the range. And I, I think most of the research now points to around 80. But I know a lot of you are walking around with two, two three, four hundreds, and you're walking and talking, so I can learn something from that. So aging causes inflammation. As we get older, again, all these inflammatory markers get higher, but youthful, keeping hormones in the youthful range protects this. Again, let's look at this IL-6. Testosterone, estrogens, down-regulate IL-6, less inflammation with youthful levels. We don't want to forget the basics. And again, in our preventive medicine programs, we don't want to forget the nutrition, the lifestyle, and even one of the basic things in conventional medicine that are useful for disease prevention, such as colonoscopy. But we don't want to forget these things that, that are established just because we've had a lot of great ideas. And again, the, what we're talking about is backed up by so much medical literature. Now, thyroid, again, that's a pet peeve. You know, there's, there's, there's an illness going around in physicians, especially endocrinologists, called thyrophobia. <laughs> and it, it, yeah, there sim the symptoms include uh, putting cotton in the ears when patients speak, and uh, <laughs> screaming matches in the doctor's cafeteria, and I don't know, accepting uh, presents from uh, drug manufacturers, perhaps. <laughs> but it's absolutely crazy what, how emotional this topic is. And, so, and the sad part of it is so many people are suffering. Hypothyroidism is getting more common all the time. I mean, it's, it, it, it's estimated that, you know, an autoimmune thyroiditis is maybe in 20% of the population. Uh, maybe in the American uh, adult uh, female population, up to 80% maybe hypothyroid, if you look at what's ideal, not just the numbers. So what we were taught in medical school is just extremes. So here were the extremes. You were hypothyroid, and now you know, you're barely alive, you're, you're cold, you're retained fluid, you can't hear voices, you know, you're barely there. You're hyperthyroid, and eyes you know, bulging, and uh, temps 105. And everybody else, oh, you're okay, you're euthyroid. But that's where the action is in our field, this giant middle range. So you're euthyroid, well, where do you wanna be? The bottom of euthyroid, barely there, but you're not in what the lab decides wrong, or the top, where you're happiest and healthiest and have the best cognitive function. And then where do the normal lab values come from? Is there some wise counsel who have pondered the meaning of life and come up with the answers? No, it's people show up at the lab, they're not dead, their numbers get put into the values, and the standard deviation is taken off on each side, and the rest of the mind is normal. No one asks them how they feel. Okay, that was that piece. Testosterone. You know, Andropause, decreased testosterone men's a deficiency disease. Again, we don't throw hormones at people. So if you look at a testosterone level, half the men between 50 and 70, if you look at their number, and you took that number of 20 to 40, the 20 year old, you say, oh, you're sick, something's wrong with you, because your number is low. But you're 60, oh, that's normal. But why shouldn't the 60 year old have the same health as the 20 year old? No reason why not. So it's a deficiency disease, and it's a lethal disease. Low testosterone is associated with everything bad, from diabetes, cognitive dysfunction, cardiovascular disease, frailty, falling apart and breaking a hip, inflammation, and higher cancer rates. There have been so many major studies of testosterone and mortality in the past few years. This, and in mainstream journals, circulation, Journal of the American Heart Association. That's one of the ways I like to bug my colleagues. It really doesn't, I don't know, that's not, I don't know probably doesn't make me that popular, but. So I'm talking to my cardiology buddy, and I'm saying, gee, look at all the cardiovascular benefits of testosterone. Like, oh yeah, yeah, I don't believe that, that's bad for your heart. 
and then my, I, I come out with my line. Uh, don't you read your own journals? What about, what about such and such reference in circulation? So, okay, I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> so comparing high to low testosterone levels. Basically, let's compare a man with testosterone of 300 to 1,000. The man with 300 has a 57% increased chance of dying at any moment of any day. Dying of all cause, dying of cardiovascular disease, and dying of cancer. Each one of those separates out. Now this was a study of endogenous testosterone, not treatment. Now there are parallel studies of treatment. So what was the old myth? Every doctor went to the same lecture. We'll see, uh, so did we went to the lecture where the professor said, Treating with testosterone is like throwing gasoline on a fire. Some of the professors said kerosene. That was the only difference. So we all are dutiful students. We take those gasoline on fire. Why don't we do that? Did we ever examine where this statement came from? What, what was the data behind it? There was none. There was one case reported in 1941 of a patient, a man who had prostate cancer, who got testosterone. One of, his lab, one of his lab tests, alkaline phosphates, got worse. That's it. One case, 1941. But it's hard to get rid of a myth because you can't dispute the evidence because it was never there. So it's amazing. Um, Journal of National Cancer Institute. Look at all the hormones. Is testosterone related to prostate? Is prostate cancer related to testosterone? No. Then a lot in our field said, well, gee, it's not the testosterone. It's got to be the estrogen. Is it related to estrogen? No. Or dihydrotestosterone? On and on. Not related. Now. Abraham Morgenthaler at Harvard has been the pioneer in explaining how this works. And I'll kind of explain some of his work, kind of channeling him. So he points out there's never been a scientific basis for this belief that testosterone causes prostate cancer to grow. And here's his most recent study. It's a small number, but it's rather shocking. 13 patients, prostate cancer, biopsy proven. They were all treated with testosterone. Now after 2.5 years, he somehow talked him into having a second biopsy. Uh, I thought friends don't let friends of get a prostate biopsy, something like that. Anyway, <laughs> he talked him into a second, they got the second biopsy. 54% were negative. So, draw your own conclusions. I think it would be a stretch to say, treated with testosterone, their prostate cancer was cured. I mean, we couldn't generalize and say that, but I don't know, come up with something else. So this, this is just the most recent dramatic study. And then there's benefits from head to toe, brain, heart, body composition, diabetes. What about estrogen? Equal time here for the women. Of course, both testosterone and estrogen are both male and female hormones. Well, of course, we've got three estrogens with their, their number is inside their name. Estrone has one in it, estradiol has di, and estri estriol, estriol has a tri in it. So that's an easy way to remember it. E3 estrogen is a weak cancer protective estrogen. It's sky high in pregnancy. And what's the FDA trying to do with E3 estrogen? Ban it. Right? They're trying to, some compounding pharmacists have been told they can't use E3 estrogen, it's an unapproved drug. And you know what would happen as E3 gets banned? Every pregnant woman would be stopped at the border and not allowed in the country because she is containing this sky high level of this banned substance. <laughs> Progesterone balances estrogen. Estrogen, sympathetic system, nervous system, energizes. Progesterone tranquilizes. Nature's Zoloft. So women, if they believe in bioidentical hormone replacement, we like to balance the estrogens, progesterone, and testosterone. Every woman gets a different balance. And it's not cookie cutter. Every, everyone has unique balance. It would be nice if we had data on women, say when they're 18, on everybody, men, women, everyone. If we had your hormonal template, for those of you youngsters here, that would be an interesting thing. Even though you don't need hormone replacement now, wouldn't it be interesting to see what your particular balance is now, and then we'll keep it that way for the duration. Progesterone also protects against breast cancer. Now, testosterone doesn't turn on prostate cancer. Well, what's the estrogen breast cancer connection? It's gotta be related somehow, but Every single study shows women who receive estradiol either have no increased risk of breast cancer or slightly decreased risks. Women with a history of breast cancer treated with estrogens and progesterone 
have lower all-cause mortality. Huge studies, Swiss studies, 23,000 women. And so it's counterintuitive because then we know estrogen does cause cellular replication. And ex this explanation is kind of come up with by Dr. Khalid Mahmoud, who's an oncologist from Minneapolis. And now you know, he is in preventive and regenerative anti-aging practice. And his first comment was, after 20 years as an oncologist, he never once spent one minute thinking about, how can I prevent cancer? I mean, he asked, well, why not? So that's not what oncologists do. It's ironic, huh? But anyway, he's uh, gone over to the dark side now and is oh, preventing yeah. cancer. <laughs> so what counts with estrogen in terms of breast cancer is what's going on in the breast tissue. And so this little diagram explains it somewhat. So again, making the point that proper doses of estradiol do not stimulate breast tissue to promote cancer. Let's see how that happens. So E2 is a stronger estrogen. E1, and we know the name from before, is strong, is the weaker one. And E2 sulfate, or estradiol sulfate, is inactive. And so in the breast tissue, we want to control the E2. Again, it doesn't count what's in the serum, it's what's in the breast. So what controls E2 in the breast? First, where does it come from? Well, some E2 comes from testosterone via aromatase. So aromatase inhibitors, like melatonin, limit estradiol in the breast. Also limits androstenedione from conversion to estrone. Now, estrone and estradiol can interact, you know, can go both ways. One can turn to the other. The enzyme 17-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type 1 turns on E1 into E2. How do you limit that? With the super antioxidants fruits, with pomegranate, with acai, with cruciferous vegetables, all the things we know are good for you, but here's part of the mechanism. Limiting 17-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase. Now, it gets better. If you turn E2 into E2S, that's a good thing in terms of the breast tissue because we're limiting estrogen in the breast tissue. Now, estradiol, E2, and progesterone, P4, are sulfatase inhibitors, okay? Sulfatase turns E2S back this way. So that's good, there's less estradiol in the breast. E2 is an aromatase inhibitor, so estradiol actually blocks this reaction. So this is just a little schematic of what's going on in the actual tissue. Are you Question. distinguishing between bioidentical and synthetic, or do these work the same either way? Okay. okay, the question, am I distinguishing between bioidentical and synthetic? Well, first, one comment first is, bioidentical is a term that shouldn't exist. Because what other kind of hormone is there other than bioidentical? The definition of a hormone is something that's in the human body that blah, 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 that does something. So the only reason the word exists is because there are strange things being put in some humans, like uh, equine estrogens. And they have horsey sounding names like equilin and equilinin, and, and there's hardly any, there's zero estradiol, and that's, that's what you want in, in equine estrogen. And so, now back to the answer the question. The rock, even with the evil premarin, CEE. -E. If you look at the statistics from the Women's Health Initiative and look at the curves for breast cancer, there's slightly less breast cancer when Premarin is used than, than nothing. When you add artificial progestin, that's what drives everything crazy. There are no enzymes in the body to degrade progestins like MPA, Provera. That wreaks havoc on the system. So that even, even with the wrong estrogen, still is somewhat protective. Now, here's what MPA does. That's a good uh, set up in the area, and what, what Provera does. Provera shuts off the process where you can't convert E2 into E2S, or E1 into E2S. Shuts off the sulfur transferase. So every time we look at the statistics on what went wrong with this horrible combination of drugs given to women, and now even the conventional OBGYN literature has come around and talking about the tragedy for 10 years of depriving women of hormones and that, well, it's probably okay if you start near menopause, you know. And then they make the statement, not backed by any data whatsoever, but just kind of plus, well, you might as well use the lowest dose for the shortest time period. Where does that come from? Nothing, just, just the ambivalence. So, back to your question, even horse estrogen improves uh, breast cancer risks. But Provera drives you crazy. Yes? Okay, what kind of effect does iodine have on this pathway? Okay, well, I, I, you know, iodine, we know adequate iodine decreases breast cancer risk and breast cyst risk. I'm not really sure how it fits into this little diagram. Okay. 
So I know Jonathan Wright talked about lowering estradiol and converting it to estriol, maybe iodine. Yeah, that, I know that's a theory of, of, of Dr. Wright. I don't, I, I'm actually, I tried to track that down. I'm not aware of that on that one way or another. But uh, he's, you know, he, he's, uh, he's way advanced, and uh, he claims never to use any, quote, alien space age molecules. And that's his definition of every prescription medicine. So, he's got a hand to uh, Growth hormone makes kids grow. You know, maybe we, it's, it sounds dangerous in adults, though, doesn't it? Grow? What if something bad would it grow? But I think it's just kind of marketing. So it's, always, it's much more dramatic in prevention than actual treatment. Have you seen this type of bar graphs before? This is, yes? You know, powerful. You, know, you can pick any, each line is backed up by a little study. It's like, here's the pink line. You know, pink ribbons for breast cancer are nice, but vitamin D, if you have a level of 51, it prevents 83%. A, that beats a pink ribbon, but there were a lot of strange things came out of this. Falls in women. Look at this, a level of 31, 70% of falls are prevented. How does that work? <clears throat> Does something to neuromuscular coordination, and athletes have noticed it. And it's, it's not considered a banned drug in doping as yet, but the athletes have noted that optimal vitamin D is something smoother about their performance and improved. Dr. Rothenberg, yes. you asked if we've seen this charge before, I've, I've seen the charge before. Give us a 30-second overview of what's okay. yeah. going on there. All right, all right. Uh, this, this is, I love this chart because it summarizes everything. And then there's little references below to explain each line. So we have, like, cancers all combined. And at what level, you see these numbers are, what level of serum level of vitamin D in nanograms per deciliter? Sometimes it's nanomoles. And sometimes it's not a gram, just if you're reading literature. Two point, you divide nanomoles by 2.5 to convert well, to nanograms. Blood level, but a test, right? Right, it's a serum test. Okay, right. sorry, I didn't make that clear. So this is on the blood test in nanograms per deciliter. Right. What number statistically prevents what percent of what bad thing? That's how this, that's how this works. Can you translate that ballpark to how many milligrams a day? Okay, how many I use a day? Well, that varies for individuals because let's, what, you know, because there's different metabolism, different amounts of fat, different amounts of sun exposure, or different. So, to summarize that point, to hit a level, say, of 80, that's a little past the chart. Again, the lab range is 35 to 100. And then maybe, again, you shape distribution to me. More is not always better. You want to be in the sweet spot. So what's the sweet spot? Say 60 to 80 or so for now. As new data comes in, we may kind of shift it around. So how do you get that? Um, well, first you can do it with no, nothing at all. If Here's the formula. Play volleyball in a bikini in Maui at noon. And don't take a shower till dinner. That'll do it. So you have to sweat in the sun and leave the sweat on. Because that facilitates absorption. A lot of surfers who are putting on, oh, don't put on sunscreen. So, okay, so if you can't fulfill that assignment, and not everybody actually should here, but um, then 5,000 average. Say three or four thousand a day to five thousand to ten thousand a day to some fifteen thousand a day. Do you agree? You know, about that year? In my experience, I've tested thousands of patients, and you know, fortunately, I'm kind of an optimist. Despite this vitamin D testing treatment, it's, it's moving over to conventional medicine, and you see a lot of just you know family practice docs, you know, you know, with good hearts, but just uh, they they haven't gone to a meeting like this, so they just don't know. But uh, they're starting to test um, vitamin D, and maybe we'll see a lot of other improvements. Now, the other part of this chart that's interesting is, let's look at this line, rickets. Horrible bone disease, I mean, it still exists in the United States. You think of it like out of Charles Dickens. Babies don't have enough vitamin D and calcium, and they start to stand, and the, the legs bow out. And all you need is a level of like 20 to prevent rickets. And so, uh, that's where, you know, like how much vitamin D is in a glass of milk? Like uh, 100 units or something, or 200 units. So it's a tiny amount, but that's enough to prevent rickets. The group at risk for rickets now are black babies whose mothers are breastfeeding and not taking vitamin D. The more melanin you have in your skin, the less you can make vitamin D from the sun. And so, you know, it's interesting. That probably is what's, what directed evolution of skin color. We all started out, just to digress for it, we all started out as black Africans, and as our ancestors, some of our ancestors migrated further north in Europe, say, 
lost, there was a trade-off. Lose melanin, you can get burned easier, but you make more vitamin D. So skin got lighter in Southern Europe and Italy and Spain, and then lighter yet in mid Europe and France and you know uh, Germany, and then in Scandinavia, it was a crisis to survive, and most melanin had to be lost and produced the lighter skin in Scandinavia. So just a little interesting analysis. So vitamin D, you know, because sometimes patients go, there's endless supplements you can take, and sometimes patients will say to me. Just tell me what to take and I'll be compliant and I don't care if it's 50 capsules. Others might say, find me five capsules a day and I'll take the, the five best. That's, practically speaking, that's what I'm gonna do. And so, you know, I'll work with you. And so, the top tier, I think, as of now in terms of evidence, would be certainly vitamin D and omega-3 fish oil. And then there's the debate, what else gets in that family? The probiotics, and maybe, I don't know. But anyway, they're, they're at the top. Um, melatonin. Well, we know melatonin tells us when it's nighttime. Sun goes down, light not hitting the retina, and uh, start making melatonin, melatonin in your pineal gland. And again, Descartes thought it was the seat of the soul, the pineal gland. And you know, we're wondering if it is. Because it's what connects, every living organism produces melatonin. And it connects life to the cycles of the universe. So that sounds pretty cosmic, huh? <laughs> but, uh, seat of the soul. Melatonin tells us it's time to sleep, most of us. Some people, if you have shift work, it'll tell you time to wake up and get wired. But also, it has, it's arguably the most powerful antioxidant. More than glutathione or superoxide uh, dismutase, it gets into the nucleus of the cell, protects the genome. Very powerful stuff. The anti-cancer effect was first noticed with the uh, realization that blind women, when you controlled for other lifestyle factors, had half the rate of breast cancer from sighted women. And so if a woman has retinal blindness, the light hitting the retina is not, going, not, not shutting off melatonin, and she's producing melatonin all the time. Uh, there's quite a few studies in conventional medical literature with conventional cancer treatments, with, along with whatever chemo radiation with dramatically better results using melatonin, sometimes in huge doses. IV, 500, 1,000, units with uh, imp improved results. And so every day there seems to be some new benefits in melatonin. Uh, Roger's thesis uh, w w was on melatonin. And he, what do you think is the most uh, interesting thing? What's one about it? Okay, I'm just putting me there. But so, uh, any risks or side effects of taking melatonin and how much is good? Okay. Anyway. Well, the only, yeah, the, the, only, the only risk is if you have a lot of cases in a heavy box on a high shelf. <laughs> <laughs> so there's really never been a reported side effect. It can make people sleepy. Some have, some have uh, scary dreams or intense dreams that either, depending on your personality, is way cool or, <laughs> you're, uh, or you're an axe murderer. Oh my, you don't, you don't want to go there. But Roger. Just, uh, got is our hippocampus, you know, because when that goes, you don't remember anything. And uh, so anything that can protect the, our, our precious hippocampus from the effects of cortisol and other stress and uh, other toxins is, is, is really big. And there's a new melatonin benefit. Oh, it's probably every day. Oh, there's a current study in, called the Maria study going on in Spain for heart attacks, acute myocardial infarction, showing up with intravenous melatonin being given. Melatonin has receptors in the left ventricle of the heart and stabilizes arrhythmias. And the study is going on to see if there's better outcome in terms of arrhythmias and repeat heart attacks and how much heart damage is by getting this intravenous melatonin. It's not concluded yet, but uh, that's another exciting use. And there's something new with melatonin almost every day. Yes? Yeah, I have a comment and a question. I noticed with certain patients, I noticed that they have imbalance with dextrone. Melatonin can be a little bit stimulating. Can you comment on that? And also, uh, what about disrupting the feedback So first, that's a good point about the calcification of the pineal, especially due to fluoride and other things. So, you know, our pineal, we need, we need a, the, maybe there's even other hormones produced by the pineal gland as well. That's a whole other topic. 
but there's such a wide range of safety, even when there's feedback loops, that usually you can, you know, just clinically, you can go ahead and treat people with melatonin to make them sleep comfortably, and, uh, you know, this, this uh, you know, you're, you're watching all the other hormones too, and if there is no interaction, then you can appropriately change it. But clinically, I never have to. Now, well, this is uh, entering into stem cells here, because melatonin increases endothelial progenitor cells. Now, of the stem cells that we have in our blood, a key component are called EPCs. And this is one of the best biomarkers of wellness. The more endothelial progenitor cells you have, and the better function they have, the longer you're gonna live and the better. Because, you know, what have we got? Our vascular systems. This is our built-in repair kit to constantly keep repairing our cardiovascular system. So we're interested in this because, I mentioned before, we bank adult stem cells for those who want it. And so we analyze, well, what do we get? What's in the bag? You know, we give some shots of a stem cell stimulant and then hook the patient up to an apheresis machine, like a blood bank machine, then end up with a, a bag of stem cells. And one thing that became apparent early on, people who just showed up, you know, quote, off the street who wanted their stem cells banked versus people who were on preventive regenerative medicine program. There was sometimes a factor of a million, or they would have a million, you know, a million additional stem cells instead of five million, six, seven, eight three or four million additional. And so there was something very different about optimized lifestyle, hormones, exercise. Now, why do people with better stem cells do better? Perhaps because they have more endothelial progenitor cells. Now, melatonin stimulates their production. So this is an immune modulator that helps keep us alive. So the paradigm shift in medicine now is from you know the era of where syringes, scalpels, pills, you know, that'll be considered quite antiquated. And most of medicine may be cell-based. So stem cells are really the tools of regenerative medicine, and we can use them right now. Number one, you should do everything you can to improve your stem cell function. <coughs> and we can even induce pluripotency in stem cells. We can take a, cell, a stem cell from one area and make it go back in time and then forward so we can produce tissues of all germ layers. Now what's the inflammation connection? Inflammation inhibits stem cell function and uh, acute inflammation, you have something wrong, you have an injury, that's different from chronic. So chronic inhibits, but if you have a definite injury, an infection, that'll turn the stem cell function on. So that makes sense because that keeps us alive. So when I'm talking about inflammation being really bad, I really should differentiate acute from chronic. Like you're familiar with the C-reactive protein lab test? That kind of measures your overall inflammation. So let's say you just had uh, bad pneumonia, bronchitis. You see reactive protein will be 200, 300. I mean, we want it less than one. But that's not a bad thing. That means, yeah, you've got an immune system and it's responding. But when it's chronically elevated at five forever for no apparent cause, that's the inflammation that sets off everything bad. So you know the definition of a stem cell. I don't know how much you've studied this. I have a back, background here. So you have a, a mother cell divides into two daughter cells. One of the daughter cells is identical to the mother, and the other daughter cell is on her way to becoming something, some specific type of tissue, some specific type of function. And so again, it's, it's called asymmetric kinetics because you have a line of stem cells, but most of them that form this big pyramid are forming some kind of tissue. Now, Stem cells, even from adipose tissue, which is our current uh, flavor du jour, have pluripotency and potential to form all tissues. Terminology, autologous from your own body, allogeneic, trapped from your body, from someone else. Now, the controversy in stem cells, you probably know, is about embryonic stem cells. And uh, the controversy ways in, you know, it's around what your definition of, of the beginning of life is. And so even though if it not, may not be my definition, but I can respect other viewpoints. And the controversy is if you define life beginning as a fertilized egg, then destroying that fertilized egg, you're destroying life, even though it was gonna get thrown out anyway. But again, I'll respect different viewpoints. In fact, embryonic stem cells are going to be very important for future research and maybe future treatments, but right now, almost all treatments have been developed from non, from adult stem cells. Now the world of stem cells, it's a little different from normal English, 
you're either an embryo or an adult. So if you're, if you're a newborn, you're an adult. If you collect stem cells from a newborn's umbilical cord, they're adult stem cells. That's just the terminology. So again, these are non-controversial. One of the tragedies here is that so many people don't, they just think that something's bad about stem cells. They don't realize that even if their philosophy about life beginning with a fertilized egg exists, most of the research has nothing to do with that. Okay. So sources of non-controversial stem cells, adipose. And adipose has turned out to be a tremendous advance. Who knew all that uh, adipose tissue was gold? <laughs> is because the stem cells in adipose tissue, especially if you haven't, a person hasn't been gaining a lot of weight, losing and gaining, they have been sitting there in suspended animation, ready to bring on the fat. But if you haven't expanded and expanded them, they've been, again, in suspended animation and they've got good telomeres. They've got a lot of divisions. And so we can harvest adipose stem cells by liposuction under local anesthesia and then purify them from lots of causes. Umbilical cord stem cells. Uh, on deliveries now, I mean, parents have their option of having the baby's umbilical cord stem cells banked. And that's good, although the disadvantage is they're not really enough to treat anyone other than a, a baby. If, when, once the child's five or six, they de if they did need stem cell treatment, they, they need more. Of course, the cells can be expanded. Now, in terms of the FDA, what can we do now? We can use adult stem cells, but they have to be, the jargon is minimally manipulated. So we can't expand them and use them. Because you know what the FDA says about stem cells from your body? It's a drug. It's their, it's their drug that they have control over, you don't. So how could, well, that doesn't really make sense to me. Is that the same in Europe or Great Britain or is it? No, it, it varies from country to country. It, it's, it's, it, yeah, in general, it's uh, much more liberal in Europe, especially Germany and Switzerland for other, other more advanced treatments. What do you mean by expand? Ex oh, expand, that's, that's jargon. That means grow more. You know, you've got, it's sitting in culture and you have a few and now you grow a lot of them. They're not, you know, not expanding in size, expanding in number. That's just the, the jargon. But what's a peripheral blood stem cell? Peripheral, I, I know, you, what, what, what do you mean? Oh, peripheral blood. And that, again, that's jargon in medicine. Peripheral blood is like the blood in your veins. As opposed to what? what? Peripheral blood, central, like in the bone, let's say peripheral blood versus bone marrow. So you can get stem cells by sticking a needle in the bone marrow, but you know, through, you know, which doesn't sound too user friendly, but not as long as it sounds. <laughs> Easy for me to say when I'm on the other side of the needle. <laughs> you, you can use local anesthesia. So ways to get them, fat through liposuction, bone marrow, aspiration, peripheral blood, or just from an IV. There are doctors that are doing autologous cells, they're extracting it, they're mixing it with UV light or other types of treatments and reinjecting that. What is that technology called? What are, what are some of your thoughts on that? Yeah, I don't really know of any data on that. I mean, it sounds promising whether it's good or not. According to FDA definition, it's crossing the line, though, as far as, I mean, that's going to that's you know, it's good for them. I'm not, I'm not condemning them for that, but they certainly could get in trouble with that. Because what can you do with stem cells? So you can take them, you can ice, you can get them out of the fat, do something. Then you have to use them on the spot. You can't. If I put them in the refrigerator or a refrigerator overnight, that's manipulating them. <laughs> so you have to use them on the spot. And that's for now. Who knows what tomorrow's regulations are going to be? So now conspiracy theory. Why is this? Like it's follow the money, right? That's what we always got to do. Of course, Big Pharma wants to have its lines of allogeneic stem cells on the shelf. You need stem cells for this or that. Hey, we got them here. You just pull them and you, here's, your, here's your, your brand. And good for everybody. And they can be mass produced and, uh, you know, charge a lot for them. So, we talked about adult stem cells. You can collect them easily. And there's no. Uh, controversy, and again, the healthier you are, the better. So we, we aspirate with liposuction, and then go through a few purification stages, and put collagenase in to dissolve the fat, and spin it around, and, and purify them, and wash them, and then get a little pellet at the bottom of the tube. Here it is, and that's what you're left with, that little pellet you sucked up with the pipette, that's the stem cells. You know, and so, it's some clear liquid in this little tiny tube. 
but I'll tell you, it is the most exciting feeling in the world to hold this tube in my hand. I don't know, I just, I'm easily thrilled. It's like, you ever see a movie Pulp Fiction? And I open that attache case and who knows what, some, you know, something's in it and it's glowing, some bad drug or whatever, but it, you know, all this glowing light is pouring out of it. But anyway, that's what I feel like with the tube of stem cells in my hand. Uh, now, I'm involved in some stem cell research that is south of the border for uh, FDA reasons. And this is done in Angeles Hospital in uh, PJ. Angeles. And, and it's a beautiful hospital. Um, and there are quite a few protocols, and I'm one of the investigators. So I point out to, to patients, for whatever it's worth, I'm not in the, any financial loop in any way with the stem cells. This maybe gives me additional objectivity. So cardiology, injecting stem cells into the heart itself, the heart failure. With a catheter in the heart, there's some little needles and go right into the myocardium. Pulmonary, we've had some of the best results. We've not had all consistent results with this. Let me just throw out some numbers here. Again, the studies are not completed, but in my observation so far, it seems about 50% benefit and 50% don't. And so one of the challenges is to try to figure out why do some benefit and others not? No one has been hurt by it. In pulmonology, there is very effective giving stem cells in the intravenous because, it, because of what's called the stem cell first pass effect. It's the first pass effect in pharmacology about the liver, but that's not what we're talking about. When you just administer stem cells in an intravenous, so they go through the right side of the heart and eventually into the pulmonary vasculature and the capillaries get smaller and smaller and some of them get stuck, they dead end. Well, that's a disadvantage if you're trying to get the stem cells to go somewhere else. But it's an advantage if you want to put them in the lungs. So this is a very accessible treatment without fancy catheterization needed for uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, for asthma. For other situations, say early Alzheimer's, they can be delivered right in the circulation of the brain. For non-healing wounds, they can be injected right into the wound. Uh, for Autoimmune disease, they can be given intravenously, and there's some other protocols, especially this is done in Brazil, which are more drastic of killing off the immune system first, and then replacing the immune system. Renal failure into the renal artery. There's no official anti-aging diagnosis on the diagnostic code, so we're calling it frailty syndrome. <laughs> and uh, again, we're tracking the patients and uh, hope to find you know, mean, meaningful results for the studies. But some individuals just that I've seen have benefited very dramatically. How does this treat type 2 diabetes? I would have expected you would have type 1 diabetes. Okay, okay the diabetes. Well, first, the, first, to backtrack a sec, in type 1 diabetes, there are some successful cures <coughs> published in JAMA uh, by Burt at Northwestern. And the type 1 diabetes cures are early type 1 when there's still beta function present. And again, this is a very drastic treatment. Uh, stem cells are banked by the apheresis peripheral blood method. The immune system is killed off with low dose chemotherapy. The patient has to be in reverse isolation because they've got no immune system. Then their stem cells are irradiated to remove the hyperreactive lymphocytes that presumably are causing the autoimmune response, then reinfused. And there are some patients now five, eight years post-procedure with uh, no insulin requirements. For type two, the idea is infusion into the circulation of the pancreas. And again, will you regrow, will you grow new beta cells? Part of the stem cell effect, by the way, isn't growing new tissue. You know, this has been one of the revelations to stem cell scientists in the past few years. A lot of it is immune modulation and cytokine control and changing the picture around the stem cell. So it's not like you're gonna, these cells are gonna grow a new pancreas. They're stopping a lot of inflammatory processes. So the type two procedure is infusion into the pancreas. Again, does it work? Insufficient data to say. What about Crohn's colitis? I know my friends who felt that before as well. Crohn's colitis, I mean, that is something that, you know, is presumably autoimmune disease. Yeah. And uh, I think definitely is, is an appropriate way to uh, try it, you know, a systemic treatment. Okay. There have been, I think, the two patients being followed, I don't know, 
not known not long enough. So this is all so new. You know, basically, since patients are paying for this type of thing, it's a price performance kind of situation. There's other double blind studies people can get into, but in this scenario, they're actually paying 20 to 30 grand, and uh, with, with very preliminary information. So it, you know, I can't. I, the, I'm, I'm most enthusiastic of all these categories about the pulmonary. But as we get more data, as more patients and more follow up, no more. I'm always skeptical, you know, any one treatment, this is going to cure everything in every way. Again, you know, it would be nice, but it just doesn't seem like biology works that way. <laughs> so back to. Good question. Well, attempts are made. Depends, you know, where's the patient? The patient is coming from different sources. So say, is patient X this? I'm kind of like the gateway into it. So again, depending on the time frame, I'll do an evaluation. I'll say, here's just a general lifestyle preventive medicine. Let's do as much as possible. But depending on time frame, they may not have had that much done. Like you Okay, well, not necessarily. I mean, I, I use that's the dose I certainly would use for uh, viral illnesses, but I want their vitamin D you know, to be in the appropriate range. But again, it depends if someone's coming from a distance. It would be nice to do it that way. They're coming from a distance. This is their expectation. They want to get this done. You know, they may or may not think this is a great idea. So it would definitely be better because we know, well, you know these, these, these stem cells are they're so precious. Why not baby them along and give every metabolic advantage possible? which I'm all for, but sometimes it doesn't happen. And so part of the difficulty with the control, it, why it's not a controlled double blind experiment, because there's all these different variables. So we talked about EPCs, better cardiovascular outcome. Um, we talked about optimizing stem cells. And I'll show you some studies on this, because this fits right into the question. Here's a study from Victor with uh, optimization for nutraceuticals published in stem cells and development. So they treated the patient for about three months here with uh, blueberry, green tea, vitamin D3, and carnosine. Why these as opposed to so many other choices? This is what they picked in, you know, in this particular study. And significant improvement in stem cell number and function. Resveratrol, again, sirtuins, mimics calorie restriction, improved stem cells. Now, Comment on telomeres because you, you know you've studied this before. If you're going to it, get a stem cell transplant or improve your own stem cells, well, do stem cells have telomeres? Well, they do if they're regular, you know, somatic stem cells. Some 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 cells express telomerase. Some cells are immortal, right? In line of sperm cells. If they want, if that line of cells wasn't immortal, life wouldn't continue. There's a, there are immortal animals, right? Like sea anemones, I mean, you know, they're not. You can eat them, and they're not. You know, they're dead. But immortal. <laughs> but immortal in the sense, you know, in the telomeric sense, that they reproduce by budding. One a bud pops off, and now it's another one. So theoretically, the first sea anemone ever alive still is hanging out somewhere. And how do they do this? By expressing telomerase, and that's why the cells don't age with time. And so, stem cells also can lose their telomeres. So is it better, so someone who's 80, so well gee, do I want to use my 80 year old stem cells for a stem cell transplant, or would it be better to use 20, 20 year old stem cells? And probably so, but 80 year old stem cells still work. And the big advantage is they're autologous. There's a lot to be said for autologous, there's no rejection, even though other forms like may, may, work, may work. So what you've studied with tel telomeres are that, you know, just a review for those who don't know, just telomeres are the end piece of your DNA. T and it's a sequence of DNA bases, T, T, A, G, G, G. A mnemonic device that may help some of us get through medical school, to touch a girl's genetic gift. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, guess. I, anyway, I guess we can figure out another one for the Texas Nevada. So every time the cell divides, you lose a chunk of telomere. And that explains the Hayflick limit. The Leonard Hayflick found if you took skin cells and incubated them, they divide 50 times and then they stop. And we see this in skin aging. The UV is beating down on my face and I'm 15, looks, skin looks normal, 20, normal 21, 22. But now I've gone through my 50 revisions and you start getting wrinkles and skin aging and susceptibility to skin cancer. 
So we're doing all these things to maintain telomeres, from lifestyle to diet to nutraceuticals to stress reduction. But if you can turn, there's an enzyme, there's a gene in our genome, telomerase, that rebuilds the telomeres. And so if you can turn this on, then you're actually reversing cellular aging and helping to prevent cancer. And now there are certain products, you know, like PA65 that was discussed, that claim to do this. The research is pretty preliminary, but uh, there is a, but it, it, it looks like it really works. There's a lab test now called the QFISH, which I guess was discussed here too. It's quirky, it costs $700 and you have to send it to Spain. That sounds like a big joke. Do they have any money to keep the lab open in Spain? I don't know. But apparently they do. And we think of trying to combine vacation packages with it. What do you think about these telomere tests that Spectre Cell Lab is running? Well, that, you see, that was the older test. That measured average telomere length. But the action turns out is thought to be now what percent critically short telomeres, less than 15 kilobases. Because even the critically short telomeres, something bad's about to happen. Either cellular senescence or thrown into a soup of mutations to form, you know, to promote cancer. And so it turns out in telomere science, this is considered a much more meaningful assessment. And so that's the trouble with the mean telomere length. And then it gives you some information. So I think if you're going to do telomere testing, I'd do this Q-fish type test, certainly. That's, that's what the publications are, are stressing now. And so they'll probably, it's expensive, this DA65 is expensive, but hopefully there'll be competition. There are some products that claim to do something with telomeres, other than that, but when I've looked at them, I, just the ingredients, they seem to be more in the category of helping to prevent telomere loss, but they don't have any data to suggest they actually turn on telomerase telomeres longer. So that's my understanting of it. So I'll show you just interesting, some interesting studies now. You know it was a Nobel Prize of the medicine in 2009 by Blackbird and Greider and Stozak for discovering telomerase. And uh, I typed in yesterday uh, telomere or telomerase into PubMed because the old slide said 8,000 publications. This happened to be, I don't know if anyone knows <laughs> Significance to numbers, 11,111 publications as of yesterday. Old ones, way back. Okay, so there's a lot of interesting studies now on stress and telomere, telomere telomerase, meditation and telomere telomerase. So I really, they've just come out recently and uh, I'll put them on our website, ehealthspan.com, because they're not in the slides that you have. Oh, you know, we do a third of our aging before, before we're born. You lose a third of your telomeres between conception and birth. Whatever that's worth. And you can see why. The cells are ra dividing and dividing rapidly. But again, when they're critically short, all the papers show critically short telomeres are what are the setup for disasters. Uh, and here's, here's a little music of what telomeres sound like as they're going. We didn't know. <laughs> we didn't know. And then when they, when they get critically short, they really sound bad. Okay. But, can you talk about once you lose them, if you can generate them back versus exercise, meditation, relaxation, qigong, things naturally right. that you can do to extend it? And all those natural things in general help to prevent loss, but don't necessarily regenerate. Although I'll show you, I'm just looking for some studies here. Okay, here's a study of mindful, uh, you know, stress, mind, and telomeres, okay? So psychological distress, eating behavior, metabolic health, okay? And this was a study of randomized mindfulness intervention. And the conclusion was there was more telomerase activity. Telomerase activity, you're growing, you're growing your own, not just losing, so possibly so. And this is a study, if you look at the, uh, you know, the authors, a lot of them are Blackburn, are, are you know, Nobel laureate. Now here's a study recently of meditation and telomeres. Meditation increased telomerase. So, there may be something to that. One more. The cortisol telomere connection. What would you guess the cortisol telomere connection was? Right. And it does. So this was a study of looking at stress, looking at the HPA axis, looking at telomere length. And high cortisol, shorter telomere length. And so, again, what percent can you actually make longer without a telomerase Turn on. We don't know. This is all new. So everything you're doing is you're on the right track. You're at least stopping telomere loss. Maybe some of it actually is regenerating some telomeres. 
Again, it fits together. Inflammation, lifestyle, stem cells, telomeres, it's all part of the same thing. And mice look good when their telomeres, are, you know, they don't look ratty anymore. Their coats look nice. And, you know, and this, this is a pretty good study. The human studies are not great studies. You know, if you really, you gotta really read the study. When I tell medical students, you know, I say, you mean you just can't read the last line of the abstract? You gotta actually read the study and look at the statistics. That's a lot of work. But that's my job to do them and try to interpret them and, you know, feed them back as a teacher. So the human studies, telomere length average increase, but in terms of clinical benefits that are published, there's not really much. In rodent studies, they actually look better and had less uh, arthritis and uh, osteoarthritis. And again, shortened telomeres go along with every, every major illness of aging. And uh, this, this uh, again, I'm not connected with this company anyway, the TA65 did. Uh, Improve critically short telomeres. Yes. Have you done any studies that correlate the use of um, hormone replacement therapy to therapy to keep telomeres? In yes, yes, and there are there is definite hormone telomere connection. So we know IGF one as uh, relates to growth hormone, which goes up with growth hormone, testosterone, and estradiol all increase telomere length or help to slow the loss, but all associated with improved telomeres. So there's a hormone connection too. There's this Harley study. Again, I think that the data is so-so. Uh, Again, there seems to be no safety hazard, no risk for the products that increase telomerase. Oh, the problem was, this is worth saying, I was skeptical for a couple of years, and I, I personally did start taking you know, TS65 a couple of months ago because of the cancer connection. So we know cancer cells are immortal, right? They express telomerase, that's the problem. If they only reproduced 50 times and stopped, there wouldn't be a problem with, with, with the cancer. But they keep going. So, if you turned on telomerase, would that be giving cancer a boost somehow? That was the question. But the answer, and really looking at all, all the major research on this, and actually personally discussing it with, with the, the, the major researchers are, it's not, it, it's a prevention strategy because to be a cancer cell, you already have to have the mutation that turns on telomerase, or else it would be cancer. And so it's already happened to cancer. The risk factor for cancer are critically short telomeres because you don't get a good cellular copy. The DNA can fragment and can recombine in ways that promote mutations. And again, animal studies and preliminary human studies agree that Critically short telomeres are the cancer risk, and restoring telomerase does not increase cancer odds. I mean, that's as we know from now. So again, I've been following it for a few years, but just personally, I decided there was enough evidence to recommend, you know, to take it myself and to recommend it to my patients. So let's see, let's put this together. Endothelial progenitor cells, we're gonna have a lab test for this pretty soon. So that'll be a, a, a very useful biomarker of, of aging, of your biological age, just like critically short telomeres. So what helps EPCs? And we'll see. Growth hormone, IGF-1, more telomerase. Estradiol, better telomeres. Testosterone, antioxidants. Melatonin, better telomeres. Exercise, red wine, resveratrol. Uh, L-arginine, you know, vasodilates, uh, lowers blood pressure, bit of an amino acid Viagra-like effect. Uh, blueberries, green tea, carnosine, stops glycation. Fish oil improves telomeres. Marine fucoidins, ginkgo is looking for a home. We know it does something good. It didn't really pan out that well as a cognitive enhancement, but yes, there's a telomere effect. What decreases endothelial progenitor cells? Inflammation. C-reactive proteins, bad stuff, as well as a marker, IL-6, IL-1 beta, TNF alpha. Does arginine feed the herpes virus? Does arginine feed the herpes virus? We read it. Yeah. I'll tell you. Here's. It's, com it, it's, you know, there's a lot to be said for folklore. And a lot of people believe that. I've had a problem with it. A lot of, but there's absolutely nothing in the medical literature. And it, there's a couple of articles saying the literature. So it's possible. So if it does, in you as an individual, don't take it. But, uh, and then does lysine help prevent the herpes virus replication? That's the other half of it. But again, it might be true, but I try to base, you know, I know I'm, on, on, on what's, what's, what's researched. So I'd certainly say to an individual, if it, you have bad side effects, don't take it. But uh, in general, it, it has a lot of beneficial effects, put that way. Yes? 
Yeah, there, there's a Qigong teacher that had his uh, telomeres measured, his wife's telomeres measured, and his are twice as long as some in his age, and he credits it from doing Qigong for 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes at night, where he does deep breathing and the movement meditation. And the yoga teachers live into their 90s now. And the meditation, TM guy lived to be 94. What would you recommend us do in the form of Qigong and meditation and yoga? Well, do whatever to keep works. I mean, there's long. And do all <laughs> yoga teachers live to 94? Um, <laughs> again, I, you know, I try to avoid simplistic answers to everything. But definitely, meditation, Qigong, yoga, all we know have widespread health benefits, and this could, this could be one of them. So, you know, I wouldn't want to just make a, a, a sweeping statement, this is all you have to do for long telomeres, because it's a you know, 110 year old, uh, you know, Zen master. But uh, do everything you can, especially, you know, things like, do everything you can in lifestyle, and in, in, in stress reduction, and meditation, supplements if you want, hormones if that's your philosophy, combine them all together, sure. So let's see, I'm gonna finish the decrease, the bad side, you know, inflammation, 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 makes stem cells worse, makes telomeres worse. Yes. Okay, Brian, the, the one thing I missed here a little bit, I think you can go over again, is where the EPCs come in, where these endothelial yeah. progenitor cells come in. I mean, as a, as a, as a focus like that, the, the uh, I mean, the endothelium is the, the lining of the artery, right? Correct. So why are they so important, and you know, I mean, and how do you get, a measure of that. I mean, is, is, is that uh, involved with inflammation? I mean, I know it is, but why, why do you, where do we, could you say some more about the EPCs okay. and why they're focal? Why are they so important? Right, endothelium is the lining of the arteries, but right. that's, the, that's where the action is in the cardiovascular system. Yeah. The beginnings of atherosclerosis, hypertension, mm -hmm. heart attacks, all come from endothelial dysfunction. Right. See, the endothelium is the lining, but that really sets the pace of what's going on in the cardiovascular system. So if you can't, if your endothelium doesn't react appropriately, you can start developing plaque in it. Maybe the artery can get stiffer, you can get hypertension. And so how do we, you know, the blood vessels, the heart's beating, you know, 724, your endothelium's getting pounded by just pressure, and it's getting attacked by all the various uh, toxins that we're, we're exposed to, both natural uh, oxidants from metabolism and external toxins. So how do, you, how do we keep, how do we stay alive when our endothelium's getting bombarded? It's because we've got a repair kit that in the bone marrow that sends out, oh, there's a bad cell in your endothelium, here's a progenitor cell, gonna go to the site and fix it. And so if you can keep your cardiovascular system repaired as the ongoing damage happens, you're in good shape. And that's why I'm saying this is such a key marker I mean, again, it's everything, you know, from, from head to toe. But this is a very accurate marker of, of, of people of health and uh, wellness. What's the test? It, it doesn't exist as yet commercially. It's now a research test done by flow cytometry. Uh -huh. But one of the things that I'm involved in is trying to make it an available, uh, inexpensive uh, commercial test that can be used, again, to assess your own, since this is a stem cell, it, it assesses your cardiovascular system and assesses your endogenous stem cell function. So yeah, you can't get there from here yet. So I don't want to get you too, too excited with it, but I think it's, it's it can be very important. Okay. Yes. Um, regarding the endothelial lining, you can still, however, um, via carotid intimal medial thickness tests through um, advanced lipid panel testing, not not just the standard lipid panel, but the advanced lipid panel testing. Um, you can get a you can get a very good um, uh, picture of how the endothelium is responding. Oh, sure. I mean, right. There's a lot of other good ways. I'm not saying it's the only way to do it, but let's say, you know, but this gives you an idea of can, 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 is their ongoing repair. So, and also, it's more than just endothelium since it's the key stem cell. So, when we look in that bag that we collected, what's in there? There's lots of EPCs and a lot of other great stem cells as well. So, it's kind of just a general, again, a marker of your wellness plus a marker of your stem cell function. So, you know, a lot of other ways I agree completely. Do you actually separate out the different kinds of stem cells in different individuals? No, you don't, no, we, we don't, we use, we use the whole thing. But we can separate them out for research purposes to know what's in there. I have a question, there's so much sort of engineering stuff now. Well, okay, that's, that, that's gonna be hard then. Uh, you cross-linked with uh, 
high-level mathematicians, top mathematicians, but through SVD analysis and actually figure out what the chain is made of and then break it down. But the SVD is single variable decomposition and an all. And then it's going to be beyond me. <laughs> <laughs> because um, we just landed something on Mars, right? And I'm here and you can't figure me out, right? So, right. <laughs> right. Right. So I was trying to see that, you know, if, if we're working in single cells, we don't know what the other cell is doing, correct? You understand right. that? Yeah. Yes, yes. So if you cross link <laughs> with other science areas, engineers and the mathematicians, you're actually going to try and line yourself up and figure out what the DNA is made of. That's my opinion. Yeah. Okay, well, we need some smart people to help us, I think. <laughs> but I mean, the biology is so complex, and that's why I almost say almost <coughs> chaos theory prone, that there are so many simultaneous variables. I don't know, is it hard? You know, so it's all variable decomposition, man, so we'll figure it out, and an all. Okay, know? well, we need your help. <laughs> Aubrey the Gray. Aubrey the Gray is doing that. He's an engineer, he's trying to reverse engineer the human body. Right. And the question is, can that be done? And I say, I have my doubts. Right. Aubrey the Gray also has said, the first immortal child has already been born. Crawls the earth at this time. <laughs> no, the first, anybody that says to an engineer something can not be done, it's always been proven wrong. No. They were probably going to say, I said I have my doubts. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we just take one or two more? Uh, in, in trying to, to keep a, a balance like with estrogen, I, I believe there's probably a lot of men over the age of 50 that have probably more estrogen than some women. True. Uh, and if that is the case, which of course, you know, estrogen can have an effect on the metabolic syndrome, mm -hmm. what is there that one can do to keep the testosterone from converting? I mean, what is So the question is about estrogen converting, testosterone converting to estrogen. Now, most, one of my lines in hormone optimization is, no disrespect, it's not engineering. It's clinical, it's fuzzy science, and it's how do you feel is more important than the number. Except, estrogen is hard to feel. A man with an estradiol of 20 versus 50 versus 70 may not really be able to tell, so anything's different. So I think keeping estradiol in the sweet spot, and we have a lot of research say that outcomes are better when say estradiol is in the 25 range. How do you do that? Well, first, some men aromatases the enzyme. So some men aromatize more than others. Uh, aromatase exists in fat, especially the dread visceral abdominal fat. Okay, so you give the patient testosterone and he's got a tendency to aromatize. You've got natural means and you've got pharmacology. So with those combination, I can make your estradiol any number I want. I have complete control. Natural means, trison, transdermal, oral, so-so. Myamin might work, works in a few. Uh, calcium deglucurate helps remove uh, estradiol from the intestinal recirculation process. So these are all possible strategies. When, if this does losing fat, and sometimes testosterone is a good feed for recycle. More exercise, more muscle, less fat, that works too. When all, when all the above don't work, and that, now we're crossing the line to alien space age molecules here, uh, an astrazole always works. And with that, we can precisely create the estradiol if we want. Can you speak a little bit about tamoxifen in its role, especially with women with, with uh, uh, breast cancer that's indicated for, and also there, I believe there's an herb in, from some islands in Thailand or something that they're given that supposedly is more powerful. Well, you know, tamoxifen is an estrogen agonist, and, and antagonist mostly, and it does decrease risk of breast cancer recurrence, but it also typically produces poor quality of life, being an anti-estrogen. And so that's one choice amongst women, but I think there's other choices as well. In fact, since we know that actual, you know, counterintuitively, that having optimized hormones does not increase uh, mortality, even in, in a setting of cancer, that's an option. But there are many conflicting ideas on this, and let's, you know, let's have a discussion, discussion with the patient on this, with that family history of breast cancer or prior history. We can say there's different degrees of controversy. One would be take tamoxifen, one might be, and we'll go up from, and that would be a conventional thing. Next thing might be do nothing. Next thing might be just use uh, progesterone if you need it. Next 
level up might be used progesterone and E3 estrogen. And then the most controversial would be use bioidentical estrogen, you know, by E2 and E3 and progesterone and testosterone as indicated. And so to make a decision like this, it's important to say what is her philosophy and belief? Can I work with her other physicians, her oncologist, and discuss quality of life factors versus risk? And with all this, we can come to some kind of conclusion what to do for the moment. And what we're doing for the moment isn't necessarily what we have to keep doing either. And it can be a work in progress. As, as well as some herb of the Thai island, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll get back to you on that I'll, after I get back. Uh, yes. What about the use of him? Jim. Okay, what, what, okay well, so what, what, is, what, is, what do you think about Jim? Well, Dim, my understanding of Dim is thiindolmethane. Also, in the same family is I3C, indole 3 carbonyl These are extracts from cruciferous vegetables, and what it does is, I saw the refer to something I mentioned earlier, it steers estrogens in the 2-hydroxy pathway to the 2-methoxy pathway. So it, it steers estrogen towards the anti-cancer, anti-atherosclerosis direction. So, yeah, that's what it does. It doesn't necessarily lower estradiol, and my understanding is it doesn't necessarily affect xenoestrogens, but it's certainly worth taking, probably for men and women. Again, there's so many things worth taking. How do you, where do you stratify it on, on the list? Certainly, we want to you know, have a high diet of cruciferous vegetables, but I think this is a reasonable thing, too. Remember, this is part of the, the mind-body connection business, that stress, you make less 2-methoxyestradiol. Okay. Well, I think, let's see, what time am I supposed to do? I, should I take one more? Or? Okay, we go, I told 9.30, yes. In using um, omega-3 and resveratrol to block an SPD, yes. would you say that if you're using them simultaneously, then they could work synergistically or they could? Yeah, I, mean, I think so. The question is, you want to block nuclear factor kappa beta, which turns on all inflammation, as we showed, we talked about before. And big blockers of that are the two. The biggest are EPA in omega-3 and resveratrol. Yeah, I think there's definite synergism, because they probably have different pathways in which they block that inflammation. So again, we're putting, you now I've got my stratification of supplements. I have D and omega-3s in tier one. And now, and, and I'll, I'll throw, I'm gonna throw probiotics in there too. That's another thing. Now tier two begins with resveratrol and CoQ10. I mean, I don't, you know, I'll, I'll change my mind on this tomorrow. So don't, <laughs> <laughs> Yes. What are the factors involved in elevated reverse T3 and how do you reverse T3? Okay. Reverse T3. So, Let's see, let's, I'll draw a picture in the air. So here's T4, or thyroxin, or commercial synthroid. There's enzymes D1 and D2, and enzyme D3. D1 and D2 take the T4 to T3. Good hormone, nice hormone. Enzyme D, so with D1 and D2, good. D3 turns to reverse D3, bad hormone. On the other side, in the breakdown, the good ones, D1 and D2, take the bad hormone here and turn it to T1 and D2. Mysterious, weaker thyroid hormones must do something. On the other side of my chart, the D3 breaks down the good uh, T3. Okay, so what turns on this reaction of making too much reverse T3? Mental and physical stress, dieting. And again, we see dieting is classic, because remember I said, reverse D3 keeps an animal alive during famine. So dieting, the organism, us, the thyroid, or you know, say, hey, it's times of famine, don't die, shut off your thyroid, go into a cave. Mental stress, physical stress, yo-yo dieting, and genetics. Some people are more, just like we talked about, some have more insulin resistance, some are more reverse T3 prone for whatever reason. So I let's. Reverse T3 is bad. How do I know it's. Well, we know it blocks the receptor site. 
And also clinically, we know that high reversity three people are of hypothyroid symptoms. And unless a physician is aware of all this, if you just look at the TSH, the stimulus amygdala, you won't know anything about reverse T3. In fact, it's where some older lab tests combine T3 and reverse T3. They didn't distinguish. So now, there's one more piece of the puzzle, because it's a good question. Also, drugs change conversion. Uh, there's a life-saving drug in emergency medicine, amiodarone. It's the answer to every question on the ACLS test, if you don't know. Again, if, if, if your heart, if you're in ventricular fibrillation, this may help stop it. But taking it every day, also you might need it to survive, but it wreaks havoc in the thyroid. It may push you to too much reverse D3. So do a lot of other drugs, beta blockers, which again can be life saving but have problems. Okay. So now we have a patient. We decide she's hypothyroid, even though her TSH is okay, her T4 is okay, her T3 is okay. My doctor says my thyroid is normal, but she's clinically hypothyroid. <laughs> Got a high reverse T3, and she's on, so how can we fix it? Well, eliminate stress. You know, like it's kind of a platitude, easier said than done, right? Change your job, don't commute for two hours on the freeway. <laughs> eliminate physical problems. But, okay, we did our best. It's still high. Now, what do you make reverse T3 out of? T4. So let's say she's getting a T4, not my choice, or a combination of T4 and T3, like armor thyroid. That, that, us that usually is my choice. But we make reverse T3 out of the T4, so I'll switch her to just T3. And now she doesn't have the substrate to produce the reverse T3. Now T3's got a short half-life, whereas often well, seven hours. The reason people should be on combinations in general is because T4 lasts seven days and T3 seven hours. So if someone's on pure T3 and she goes away for the weekend and forgets it, she's going to crash. So the T4, because most people convert somewhat, some better, some worse, the T4 gives you a stable, long-acting version. But now this person who just can't feel right because of this reverse T3, brain fog, it can't lose weight with exercise, you switch her to all T3 and reverse T3 drops and she's got her life back. And I've seen that happen quite a few times. How about time release T3? That's a little better, and a little better than just commercial, you know, cytomel, but it still, it still is a pretty short half life. So you still have to do it at least twice a day. Yeah. Could you comment on this notion of uh, estrogen eating cancer? They were trying to they, they knock down the estrogen because they say that's what's causing the cancer. And that well, again, problem. it's part of the cancer process, but I showed you the diagram of what, you know, the estrogen that and you're involved in the breast, and estrogen has so many other effects. That's why there's the counterintuitive thing that even women with estrogen receptor positive cancer live longer when they're on, on hormone replacement when they need it. But again, that's so, it's you know it, it, this is much more ingrained than even the prostate controversy. So again, you can't. If someone's belief system is that it's dangerous. You wouldn't want to do it. That testosterone causes prostate cancer to grow. Oh, you know, just to, oh, pre associate. What about, what's the update in the prostate? Yeah, this is the, the new prostate cancer con pro prostate controversy. Well, hey, preventive medicine, we love preventive medicine. We want early detection and pick up things early and get rid of them and, you know, save lives. So PSA tests, well, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna pick out the prostate cancer patients and save their lives. Unfortunately, you know, the current controversy is sad for preventive medicine and sad for, all pa for patients, too. PSAs, turns out, don't save lives. Now, how could that be? Big Swedish study, thousands of men, those who get PSAs and don't PSAs, there's no difference in mortality. Now, of course, there's individuals. One guy could say, hey, a very aggressive prostate cancer was diagnosed when I was 40, and if I didn't have that surgery or whatever treatment, I'd be dead. And it might be true for him. But there's someone else who's not voting who had complications from various procedures and died from that. And it turns out there's no benefit from doing PSAs. Now it gets worse. It's not necessarily the trend Mike says it's the trend. Well, I disagree with that. It still doesn't help. 
I disagree. <laughs> now, now it gets worse. What about surgery? What about radical prostatectomy for cancer? I mean, someone who's got prostate cancer, it's not a pleasant thought. No increase in, no, no, no increase in, in uh, longevity, no decrease in mortality. So we're really stuck. Now, there are some new tests for genetic tests, PCA3 tests, which might be better. But even the trend, even those who say you go from a, a one to a five, there's really, if you look at the data, there's no increase, no decrease in mortality. Either if you do that or you don't do it. I mean, I'll show you what's, you know, the current. So I'm, I'm stuck. What, what do you think, Bill? So the part of the problem is, what's the percentage of men who die from prostate cancer? Well, percent, five percent. What's the percentage so, of men who have prostate cancer? Uh, it rises almost, you know, with decades. So at age 60 or 50 percent, 70, 70 percent. So yeah, your age is. Okay. If so some people think that prostate cancer may just be a life cycle. It is part of the growing of, of growing old in men. It's actually part of the normal cycle of growing old. The problem with the PSA is what you do with it. Uh, PSAs don't kill people. Acting on PSA <laughs> kills people. <laughs> it's not the PSA. It's the train is now moving down the track. Okay. Very well That's said. So you actually, it's not the PSA, it's getting put on the conveyor belt. <laughs> towards biopsy, 5% infection rate, towards radical prostatectomy. I mean, maybe we no doubt can do better and pick out some out of this group. And because young, there's some young men who would die from prostate cancer, but even though most men die with prostate cancer, not from, not from it. But it's really sad for preventive medicine. Doctor, if you or yourself were diagnosed with a high-grade prostate cancer, such as a gruesome eight, and it was near the capsule, what would your personal protocol be for yourself? Myself? Well, you say, oh, yeah, well, that's all different. It's me. I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> I'm scared. I don't, like, I don't like the thought of cancer inside me. That's creepy. I want to get rid of it. I mean, that's how everyone's individual psychology would be. I, and seriously, I probably would. Whatever I believe, I don't know if I would go with it, and I would, I would say, Geez, high grade is near the capsule. It might kill me, and go. The cow might get out of the barn. I might want surgery. Is that the rational thing? Well, if you knew that particular information, it might be. I'm not saying surgery doesn't help individual cases. I'm saying you look at the population, and uh, you're going to get, you know, and it's going to be, even if they do the biopsy and so forth, and then they do all kinds of things, and you, you know, affect your urinary function, your erectile function, all that, and you never had a problem to begin with. So there's all these considerations which back up what he's saying. If anybody wants to, to, to check that out, I filed it. So just give me a call and I'll give you the reference. Yeah, there's a series of articles in the New England Journal of Medicine. There's new one even in the past, all in 2012, which go through this. And again, it, part of it's a debate in and back. And uh, you know, some, of course, the urology establishment may have different ideas. But uh, even, even the, you know, the other concept of the advancing PSA, because there's a lot of reasons PSA goes up besides prostate cancer. BPH, now better than new, word, new term is LUTS. You know, for if the prostate's bigger and there's more problem urinating, that's gonna produce PSA. Bicycle riding can produce PSA. A lot of patients with positive biopsies, it is positive. But he never, he would die of a heart attack at 80 before prostate cancer at 90. So it's, it's, even though some lives could be saved by it, it's hard to pick them out of the pack. That's the dilemma right now. This PCA3 test, which looks for genetic variations in cancer cells, may be a whole different era. And that's done, it's a urine test done after, as the package insert says, after an attentive prostate exam is done, quote unquote. That's the word they use. You know what that really means. Top three walk away from Five things. Top three to five things. Okay. Uh, You're on the right track uh, nine, from your nine, lifestyle nine, to your supplements nine, to nine, keeping your stem cells and telomeres <laughs> in optimal shape. Measure, measure the things you can measure in the lab from your B12 to CoQ to vitamin D. Measure your hormone levels. Even if you're young, get a snapshot. And if it's your philosophy, optimize your hormones as you get older. And just keep doing what you're doing and stay at the cusp of knowledge because you've got to figure it out for yourself. You know, no one else is going to spoon feed it to you. That's why I really admire your, your, your group here. So, I don't know, those are a few things.
practice what your what your website is and so forth. Okay. Okay. Practice in uh, San Diego uh, in Encinitas, nice little uh, beach town in the, uh, San Diego. Practices on the campus of Scripps Hospital there, and the website is eHealthSpan. Again, it's, that's what counts the health span. No, 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 no eHealthSpan.com. One word. Okay, great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. That's why Smart Lab Forum is great. I mean, there's a ton of information, more than you, you could possibly handle, but I take it most of this is on the website. So, you know, I hope you're all grateful to, to, uh, to Mike for bringing him and for Ron for doing this kind of rework. Uh,